man, we haven't done a show in a long time. I haven't done a show in a long time either. I've been traveling really? and yeah, I yeah, haven't done a show in like a month. Do I? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I just got an email from somebody the other day. They said, uh, "Well, you haven't done a show in a while, but uh, if you want an, uh, another uh, guest for your show, we have somebody." I get, I get rusty yeah. too. You know, forget how to actually host this thing. That's a shocker. You have email. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what are we? What are we doing today? Non fungible tokens. Non fungible tokens. Have you and heard of crypto kitties? Yeah, <laughs> I, I haven't. I haven't looked into it other than than when I heard that the guy made a kitty for like a hundred grand, or he sold it for a hundred grand. Right? Is that? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, one was sold for 140,000, one was sold oh. for 170,000 even, but and it's like just an I it just a, on on screen, right? You can't it's just a uh, It's just on the blockchain. Just on the blockchain. Well, it's actually not just on the blockchain, but we'll we'll, t we'll talk about it. Is it a, a game? More detail. Is it like Pokémon type of thing? Is it uh, uh it's not like Pokémon, but yes, there's there's a game that attaches okay. to it. All right. But We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. It, it sounds in very interesting. Um, it, does it this is. have any, is this anything like? Um, I know that that some companies are now they're they're uh, digitizing assets. Like, um, did you really just say that? <laughs> <laughs> are you pulling no, not, my not, leg not now? <laughs> not digitizing assets. Sorry. Um, were they, they, they like a, like autographs? Like, there's autographs or like sports memorabilia, or, or right? So or that baseball cards. Yeah. So that's the other. Um, example of it the mlb okay. thing so yeah. that, that's also uh, an esc 721 that's also an nft also non non-fungible token non -fun yeah. okay so great well now i'm interested okay I, I just uh well, had it, some of my my uh baseballs and footballs and a helmet authenticated by beckett is beckett getting into this beckett doesn't he play soccer no that's beckham oh <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah i don't know anything about yeah, cricket i'm not even a, a <laughs> soccer guy um yeah, Beckett. They they authenticate sports memorabilia. I'm sorry to hear that, but good. Well, that, no, it's good because yeah. you, you they were selling all these, right. and I had I had two I had two baseballs that I bought years ago, a Joe DiMaggio and a Mickey Mantle, that turned out to be fake. Oh, yeah. really? Where did you buy them? Don't tell me. I but. bought them at a baseball card shop. Really? Yeah, in, uh, in Lake Forest. They're no longer in business because I went. Uh, when I got <laughs> because them back, they're so, so I actually fakes. Went, well, went back to the place to go let them know, and they uh, were out of business. And I'm like, that, oh. that's actually a really good pre-roll because yeah, we're mm -hmm. gonna talk about applications for that. As Great. And you didn't even know. I, d I didn't, <laughs> and uh, this this brings me closer to home. See, now. there's utility for the Wonder Dog. Yes. So um, here we go. We're gonna talk about. Um, Non fungibles. Non fungibles. All right. But so since this is the hard word, we're all going to start first with fungibles. Okay. So, so should we go to the uh, let's slides? Let's go to the slides. Yes. Okay. Um, oh, where is it? And it went that's away. Uh, that's my article on there Forbes we to go. that topic. Non fungibles. Digital non fungibles. Digital. Yes. Okay. And so let's start with what a fungible is before we explain what a non fungible is. Okay. So. That would be slide number one. Oh, <laughs> we're going back to. <laughs> Sorry. I'm dealing with professionals uh, here. There we go. There we go. No. All right. So okay, fungibility. Fungibility. So okay. um, fungibility is kind of the idea that one item is exactly the same as another item, and not it's not the same item, but you it's interchangeable. Right. Okay. So that's a quality that's typically thought after in things such as fiat currencies in printed form or in minted form, so your coins and your, your fiat paper money, if you want to call that money, but that's a different story we get to another time. And in commodities or consumer goods, as okay. you can see here, even though the, all those Coke cans have a different color, but um, it's basically, not basically, it's, it's the same can as far as you're concerned, yeah. unless you're starting to collect those, and that's why specifically I chose those colors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, now that you know what a fungible is, now we can go to what is a non-fungible. So in the context of crypto and the blockchain, a fungible is a unique virtual item. And typically when you have something that's digital, 
it's very, very hard, used to be very, very hard, obviously, to create something that's unique and digital, i.e. an MP3 file. Once you have it, you make mm -hmm. as many copies as you want and you send it around. And yeah. I have the same utility as you listening to this MP3, MP3 or MP4 file for that matter. Um, if I have a PNG, an, an image of sorts, image file of sorts, if I make a copy, I send it to you, you have the exact same experience, you have the exact same image, yeah. and I still have a copy, right? So what blockchain introduced, and there specifically Ethereum initially with their ERC721 standard is what we call a non-fungible token. And so these non-fungible tokens uh, create an entry on the blockchain. It exists only once, and it uh, links back in this particular case to, let's say, an image, right? So a PNG, and I'll, I'll put one in there. And by the virtue of this being a blockchain entry and mm -hmm. connected to the cryptographic token paradigm, I can use my private key, send it over to you, to your digital wallet, you have it now in your wallet, and I don't no longer have it in my wallet. So, so you can actually transfer an image that can't be copied. That can't be copied. This particular okay. entry that you then control certifies you have this particular item. Wow. So as we discussed mm -hmm. in the pre-roll, this got somewhat media, ma mainstream media attention, was mentioned in the New York Times, and specifically, because of the uh, some of the high prices that people were willing to pay for it. And um, one of the initial ones, if you uh, jump to the next, I think it is, was sold for 140000 and recently one was sold for $170,000. So what it does, it creates true ownership. So this okay. was the one Crypto that Igor yeah. bought, and he actually outbid another prominent figure for that. So he paid $140,000 in Ether, though, at the time for it. So if you translated this back into Ether, because at the time Ether was worth much more, oh, okay. it would be, would be less regardless. I mean, uh, for all intents and purposes, that's what he paid. And um, Mike Novogratz, so who a lot of people watching this will probably know, is one of the more famous figures in the cryptocurrency space um, had participated in that bidding procedure up to $115,000. Really? And, and then stopped. Um, but he, he still thinks it's going to be worth a couple million dollars in 10 years from now. At, the, at least that's what he said. But I think what's more interesting is kind of the next slide, and that speaks to the utility of this, uh, which means this is our friend Vitalik, um, the Ethereum founder, obviously, and he uh, really likes this paradigm because he ha had been an, an avid gamer, as a lot of people in the blockchain space have been before they got into the space. And uh, he had lost one of his in-game characters uh, in 2010 after Blizzard wow. stopped supporting a certain game. And so uh, now, even if the game was no longer supported, that you would use this particular character on because it's recorded on the blockchain. You, you could still hold on to your game character and then presumably once uh, a game will be developed uh, that will then allow the importing of that particular character, you could again use it because as okay. you can imagine, you can add additional skills and outfits, be creative with, with your character or in-game items and then it, it seems like very natural that you want to hold on to that and oh, keep yeah. using it regardless if if the game changes so to speak well right? uh, once once they once they create the game and that character or like the, or the crypto kitty is there a chance that these things die or that they no longer exist uh, well there's two things to that so first of all the the main thing to differentiate is for the time being um, the blockchain utility is somewhat limited in terms of just signifying the ownership. So what, what you're transferring is the ownership to that item. Um, and for the time being, and we'll get to this uh, in further slides, but uh, none of the other characteristics that are in the game environment will be transferred. What I mean by that is, um, so 
you use your CryptoKitty as an example uh, inside of the CryptoKitty game. The CryptoKitty game, though, ha is happening on a side chain or in that particular game environments for, for all intents and purposes in the database, right? Okay. So any features such as breeding of those kitties or racing them or any other new game environments that they can come up with because this particular implementation is an open source uh, code um, that's limited to that particular sidechain. So that means if the the company or the project that's maintaining this particular environment goes away, all the functions go away with it. You still hold on to the entry. You still hold on to whatever is on mainnet. So you can go to a, a block explorer now and see your crypto kitty. But um, if that game environment should go away, so yeah. that that's all there is. It's something. It's better than nothing. But the interesting part is then to see and what particular functions the game environment provides that have utility for the blockchain itself. Yeah. So the breeding function, for example, it's like should there be a standard on the blockchain, a protocol on the blockchain that documents that? Mm -hmm. I mean, the answer seems obvious, but it just it doesn't exist yet. Okay, got it. But so the the point there is you, you have a game environment where you can test those ideas. Okay, and if you transcend this away from your kitty uh, and move this to, to other things, you can obviously then create way more interesting scenarios, i.e. Um, you have your virtual game character, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, your mini you and your, your mini you is, is male and has a certain statue and um, a certain height and a certain rights and so forth. So if you test those in a game environment, you can see how eventually you can implement those protocols and ha have real world usage for it, right? So yeah. the, I was just giving um, some input on on uh, systems that provide uh, blockchain utility for the healthcare space, right? So you can see where you can test certain scenarios of what type of records and how to track those records and can just use the gaming environment to do so. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah. Got it. All right. All right, so let's move to the next. Let's see what else I noted down, Kay. jotted down. Well, so that's very sad that he cried himself to sleep on that whole thing. <laughs> that's what he <laughs> said. <laughs> so, so to put this into perspective, I think for some reason we, we spoke about this before. Maybe yeah, uh, yeah, in-game items. Yeah, in-game so items. Yeah. Yes. So th this industry is bigger than and than video and which is bigger than Hollywood the game itself. And it's bigger than the game itself, and that's where most of the revenues are coming from, but you, I think it, you can easily see how if people spend a dollar or five dollars or sometimes hundreds and thousands of dollars for an in-game item, that if that item or that, that particular game goes away, you, you'd still like to have ownership of that item oh, since you spend yeah. money for it, right? Mm -hmm. And you might even want to be able to sell this to someone else. And right now, um, outside of a couple of second marketplaces, um, wha what's happening is people need to actually transfer their entire account, right? So you can't easily sell these items separately. You need to hand over wh whatever account information unnecessary to access the, the game itself when um, you might only want to sell a certain item that you acquired in the game environment. So with blockchain technology and the particular standard, that's non-fungible token standard, that that's going to be possible. and um, can actually happen on an app, as an example, on your phone. So you don't actually have to access the game environment in all at all, right? Okay. So you can transfer ownership peer to peer. Wow. So then there is another extension of that. So um, with which one of our partners that we're working with uh, introduced uh, this multiverse gaming idea. The idea that you can create one item and transfer it from one game to another, which is, is uh, needless to say, super powerful, specifically if it pertains to a character. Okay. Because chances are you want to be the same character in one game and then in the next one. And it will then also allow those developers to, to create one-of-a-kind items and sell those so that means that you don't just get to pick from uh, a n limited number of items but potentially an unlimited number of items so you can imagine a scenario where eventually you'll be able to not eventually but pretty near term in my opinion will be able to commission your specific character for a certain game i want to 
look a very specific way, a unique mm. way yeah. in a particular game. And uh, this new technology makes uh, this available to you and lets you own this. And you're the only person on that planet then that owns this. Just you would be the only person in a, in a real world scenario that gets to own a certain Picasso or another um, piece of art. Oh, okay. Well, no, no, that goes to another question now. So, if you if you have a, a a character that you can transfer between games, does it only exist while it's playing in that one game? It can't exist in two games at once. It's up to the game developer. So the, the SDK, the software development kit that okay. enables that, allows uh, the game developer to, to change those particular um, rights to okay. that character. Because so if, if if we're talking about the, like the blockchain, um, and you were saying like uh, there can be only one crypto kitty. Right, that if that character exists, he could only exist in one place at a time, right? Yeah, and so th there's two elements to that. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the blockchain really only documents your ownership of it. Okay. Right. So th that doesn't mean it it can't then exist in two different environments, right? Because it will always exist on the block explorer. Because then you're not transferring ownership of it. You're, you're just transferring ownership of it. Oh, you yes. are. Yes. Well, if, if it's in two different environments, not the environments. Okay. You transfer ownerships between if you individual own it. individuals. Yes, okay. but uh, the game environment again is a, that's a side chain. Nothing, Got nothing it. happens per se unless um, that's built in through the SDK. Unless the, the game developer decides, okay, if if you use it in that game, I'll make it disappear in the other one. Right. So mm -hmm. that's simply a software decision. That for the time being, okay. again, that's not. It's only for the time being that this is not possible on the blockchain itself. Yeah, I mean, you could write a specific, well, uh, it's gonna be written into the specific smart contract for this particular item. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a, a smart contract is obviously not the protocol itself. So uh, the smart contract would say if, if you're using it in game A, you cannot, it yes. won't exist anymore in game B. Correct, so wh while, you're, uh, while you're writing, this particular relationship, uh, you attach. Or if you lose it in game A, yeah, it'll never exist in game B again. Or you could, or it could just die. Yeah, it could have a, a concept called perma death, and it could just stay forever in that game and hook wow. be hooked to that game. Right? <laughs> okay. So that's, uh, I think, the Monica I came up with, but probably someone independently published that too. So, um, in Crypto Kitties, a new kitty is born every fifteen minutes. So. It, uh, if you carry this paradigm forward to other games, you can imagine a lot of interesting scenarios where a games uh, studio or publisher could create a new hero, Kay. like every hour, automatically, like write an algorithm and create something that's somewhat unique from all the others. Oh every wow. hour, programmatically, okay. puts it out for auction or for a fixed price for sale, but you will see the game environment becoming more and more like the real world, essentially, other than your typical game environment would, mm -hmm. would have a lot of the same characters, and here you would see more and more unique items over time. And if you move to the next slide, the, this is just a couple of examples where you can basically um, do simple things and uh, exchange them. Th this is one of the kind of current implementations, but you can also envision where you pass these out to the blockchain where people will then be able to upgrade their armor or their belt or their, their weapon slots or their wigs or whatever you have wow. um, okay. individually on that item. So not only would you obviously be able to create entirely new game characters, but also the accessories for that. And so there's already um, a few wallets, when you move to the next slide, you'll see those um, that support this. So um, the, your typical Ethereum wallet will support this ESC20 standard. So okay. that's, that's the reason w that most people will know that um, this particular environment is so interesting because there are so many wallets and most exchanges support this particular standard, ESC20. Uh, and so this new standard, this ESC721 standard, although it's no longer that new, was forked into mainnet in June. Um, uh, this is now supported by a handful of wallets out there. So in, in Coinbase published a separate wallet that supports the standard engine did and um, our friends over at Mozilla did. So what this allows you to do, I can sit next to you and uh, I can pull up my wallet here and then just show you the collection of my 721 tokens and you can say, oh yeah, I like that one, can you sell it 
to me for a dollar and then it wants me to upgrade obviously now that I'm trying to show it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but here uh, is one of my fee oh, lines. Oh, look at that. And, and so I can transfer it from here to here. Wow, you right, have a crypto so kitty. I, I actually have a whole herd now. You do. Because I've been demoing it so much that I <laughs> keep reading them <laughs> while I show it. So now I, I'll, I'll send you this one later. Oh my <laughs> so you God. So can, you can have it. Wow. Um, well, I'll show it to the kids at home there. Oh, mine? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, yeah, it's fuzzy. Wow. But, uh, Look at that. Well, this is now Wonder Dog's kitty, <laughs> so w Wonder Dog gets gets to have it. That's um, awesome. And <laughs> we'll send a couple of other ones, but yeah. so, but uh, so, this this all sounds just like goofy and maybe semi interesting and funny and whatnot. But um, from a venture capital's perspective, there's actually real world utility to be had, and I think we're gonna move move over a little bit more into wow. into that realm now. Um, and so there's already a bunch of websites now where you can buy and sell these items and typically they came from the, the skin sales items, so from the, the old world game item, if you will, from the legacy systems, um, where some of the publishers mm -hmm. already allowed um, the, the resale or pre-sale of these particular items. But then they also now support these new standards. So if you go to Wax, so you'll hmm. be able to then buy CryptoKitties there if you want, if you choose to. And so these are these are the websites: Wax, uh, Rearbits, yeah. uh, okay, yeah, OpenSea. Yeah. So okay. the, the, the ship there that's OpenSea. So right. you you could buy and sell your 721s there if you want to. Wow. Okay. So you can put them up for whatever you want to on there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Let's see, what do we got? So um, the benefits of an initial collectible offering. So my, my partner co coined this term, which I find useful because it's it's still resembling this old pa paradigm. But now if you're a game developer, it might be interesting for you to um, test uh, your theory that this game is going to be interesting for people out there by just creating all a bunch of your in-game items and create them as 721s and try to pre-sell them, right? To try uh, to go out there and offer them for sale so you can test whether or not people are actually interested in your particular game environment. Create a white paper that says, okay, this is what I have in mind. My, my game should be doing this. My game characters and my game dynamic is the following. Uh, what do you people think? Do you want to basically fund the rest of the development for this particular game, right? It allows you to create a community. Wow. And it's an interesting variation in my mind for um, on an initial coin offering that actually is more engaging and actually provides a good utility for game enthusiasts out there to either fund their game or support their game. And think about it this way, let's say uh, that team would not sell enough items to finish their game, mm -hmm. you would still own that particular item and presumably, if it's interesting enough, would actually be worth more. Wow. Right, because okay. the game never got made. Yeah. I mean, that's always the example um, that I made. If you're, if you're old enough, you'll, you'll remember cartridges from, from the Atari area, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, this one ET game, if you haven't seen the documentary, watch it, uh, where Atari tried to make a game based on E.T., which is... I think I had that game. You have that game? Yeah, I yeah, think I did. Yeah. They only sold, I forgot what the actual number was, but they expected to sell millions of copies and they ended up selling a few thousand of copies. So yeah. most of them ended up in a landfill and then because most of them never went into distribution, it became a collector's item. So <laughs> wow. So you got a collector's item. So yeah. the, the story there is you could um, assume that something similar mm -hmm could and might and will happen if a game ends up not being menu yeah goes so into you production the, the you, you still have the, your in-game item that's awesome. and th so there's other interesting scenarios how to make those items where you actually build in coins if you use um, the engine development uh, software development kit where you can actually build in coins so you kind of have a base level value of those and if that coin goes up your item goes up regardless, right, in, in value. So, okay. um, and that's that's the reason why why our company formed a partnership with that because it's a very interesting concept that also then translates 
um, to the real world really, really well. And that's something that we sketched up in this particular scenario. So uh, we'll do a couple of initial wine offerings next year. So oh. what? I, so and here's where the uh, where the connection is. So um, actual wine. Oh yeah. And so the way this will work is uh, if you have a winery and. Right now, the way you're presumably selling this, you uh, by having your salespeople call up a couple of distributors and tell them, well, we expect to bottle about 100,000 bottles this year, and we're typically selling them for that, uh, this particular price. We're thinking this is a good year. We want to sell it for a little more. And uh, you're trying to do your price discovery, and um, it, it's, it's pretty hard to get to a correct pricing model in okay. this particular field, right? Because unlike... Um, other commodity items like your corn and so forth, which is fairly stable. Um, wine is kind of its own thing, and a couple of other um, semi-commodity goods uh, are more or less interesting based on the rarity, based on the qualities that are being assigned to them, right? And so why the blockchain standard makes sense for this particular case is just envision the following. So you can create um, a number of non-fungible tokens on the blockchain. Go to next one. And um, then pre-sale those NFTs w that will show your um, actual item that you'll be getting. But the item will be attached to a real world. Um, good. So... Actually, we wanted to first show the previous one so okay. you get a little more granular detail because this is kind of the big picture. Okay. So the left part is, is showing the Ethereum blockchain, okay. right? So you're creating your NFT that you c then typically would show as a QR code. So now you've got a unique entry on the blockchain and a QR code. So you got your QR code then on the bottle. And so needless to say, the bottle doesn't have to exist at the time when you create the blockchain entry. So you're expecting to create 100,000 bottles at a minimum, okay. and you expect it to be of a certain quality and look a certain way, so you can get create a pre-sale market of that particular inventory, put it out there for pricing, basically, and tell people, hey, this is our expected outcome. You can buy a particular bottle right now, and it's at this particular price. We don't know what the price will be, so they're guaranteed to, to get a, a bottle of that. Uh, they're guaranteed to get a specific bottle. Okay, that's the interesting part. Oh, so you can go through number one, or you can find out whatever. Exactly, because the even first bottle or the last bottle or the middle bottle. And what's interesting from there, obviously, is once you have a specific item that you're buying, so you can then create more interesting variations to track that particular bottle. So you can have an app with your wine cellar on your phone and because it's relating back to a unique entry on the blockchain it will also know quote unquote about what happened to the rest of the batch so you're starting out with one out of let's say 10,000 bottles yeah and then eventually you look at your wine cellar and think wow i got one out of 10 bottles left of this particular year and you can oh, so you would actually know yes. how many are left in the you world know, and you don't necessarily have to take delivery of it either. So uh, either the winery or there's wine custodians out there would just keep that particular bottle, and you can buy it simply for speculation, yeah. right? And because you're a collector, and you create an entirely virtual market place, but it's relating back to very, very specific items. Wow. And so the reason why... I mean, this is already very interesting, but the the reason why to us this is very interesting is because now you're reaching, starting to reach over into the real world from the digital world, right? Okay. So you, you got your fungibles, now you got your non-fungibles that I call the blockchain native fungibles. So your Bitcoin is blockchain native. That's that's where it was born. That's where it always existed. Then you got uh, your digitally native. Um, goods which are like your games your music files your video files mm -hmm. uh, you can attach a new um, blockchain entry to them to make them trackable uniquely trackable and then also and that's part of 
uh, the article that I just published in Forbes um, is explaining in greater detail. If you look back into the history of um, music distribution, for example, it used to be you would buy first a cassette tape, um, actually it was first um, albums, like long, long play albums yeah. on... 40, um, yeah. Yeah, 12 inch and then 45s yeah, and, so then, uh, yeah. and then tapes and then CDs and but uh, now uh, hardly anybody still buys CDs anymore right yeah. so yeah. obviously if you if you buy a long play if you have a cassette tape if you have a CD if you once you don't like it anymore I can sell it to you right so I bought this for $20 I don't like it anymore and I can sell it to you for $10 and it still ho holds some form of a trading value well um after this paradigm kind of died with the introduction of platforms such as iTunes, where you, you don't actually get true ownership, you get a license of sorts, right? You get yeah. the license to be able to use this particular MP3 file or whatever format they have, and it's encrypted with digital rights management in a certain way. So you get to use it in your own devices in like five, up to five devices mm -hmm. in, in iTunes case or you you're renting something on, on Amazon, or even if I buy something on, on Amazon once in a while, I'll buy a movie on Amazon, but um, I buy it in a way that it shows up in my Amazon library, but I, I'm unable to sell it to you after I watched it, right? Yeah. So unlike when I bought a DVD before, I could watch it and then sell it to you and then uh, kind of mitigate my expenditures there. Um, now, with this new standard, you can do this again. That's great. Yeah, so you're stuck with an MP3 that you didn't yes. like, and you can't get rid of it. Right. Of, of course, yeah, uh, I don't expect yeah. um, iTunes or so Apple to adopt this anytime soon because this is a huge money man maker for them, obviously. And yeah, they, they would, will stop making it, as it much would, money. It would cut into their revenue, presumably. Yeah. Presu maybe not, um, but presumably it might. But um, we expect to see platforms that, that will introduce that paradigm, and then they are probably starting with independent artists first and then moving on to larger production studios once people will expect this paradigm. And also, it, um, you're in a way introducing another type of buyer, right? So if, if I'm buying something and I cannot return it or I cannot um, resell it, uh, then my threshold, my friction is, is higher. I, I, I will think longer and harder about an expenditure if um, I, I can never resell this to someone else. Like yeah. for when you buy a car for cash, um, presumably you have that idea of eventually I'll be able to, to resell that yeah. and I'm not stuck with this forever. So that's why it might in your in your mind you're thinking okay i'm spending ten thousand dollars now and i can buy it for i can ride it for a couple of years and then i'll still make a few thousand dollars afterwards kind of yeah. the residual effect so uh, you can imagine that similar uh, considerations might factor into um digital goods as well like when i spent twenty dollars on on an early release of a movie on on amazon if i know that i can recoup 50 percent of that afterwards i might be more likely uh, to sell that or to buy that in, in the first place yeah. but again the, these are all market dynamics that I will figure out then the the fi final slide to that and that's mm -hmm. why this is such an interesting topic is once you have an item on on the blockchain at an immutable record you can expect to see W more and more interesting developments on the actual main chain protocol. So what this uh, slide is trying to explain to you, so you got the upper half, you got your bl your blockchain level, and uh, the, the lower half is kind of the real world, and uh, we need to m fix that later. The, the, uh, the All the real world items belong on the bottom. And so, uh, like I explained earlier, you can start by just creating the entry and just basically create a database with information that it's linking back to this entry, i.e. this database entry is connected to this particular blockchain address and um, it signifies ownership for a 2018 bottle of red wine that has been bottled in this particular region on that particular day from, from this particular plot um, that looks a particular way and then it goes to a virtual market of sorts and then ownership to the entry and with that the right to the bottle gets transferred to 
another person. And then from there, you would assume that, okay, eventually I might take one take possession of the actual item. So now what happens? It, it goes onto a truck, right? So mm -hmm. now it's in the supply chain. And there you'll have other blockchain applications, right? So you'll have information about routes, you have information about the vehicle, you have whatever type of information you might be interested in storing. So what we expect to see is you get more elaborate blockchain protocols, main chain protocols that facilitate that particular behavior and then link back to this NFT. So once it, uh, to make it more, more digestible and more um, visible in a way is once it arrives at the next storage facility and that storage facility also deploys a blockchain-based IoT solution, as an example. Uh, you can then reliably track that this particular bottle, for example, was always kept at a certain temperature. Oh. So yeah. because the blockchain will provide you with the information that's associated with this particular warehouse that this particular bottle was in at a particular time. Yeah, and so they and keep all those records. And and yes. It, it, that lives on the blockchain forever. Exactly, yeah. so that was not possible in the past. I would you have could fake all of that, you could yeah. forge all of that, and not you could only make that all yeah. up. Yeah, not only could you um, forge and, and fake all of this, but uh, think about like just the the detailed information that you would have to transfer because really what happens in the first place is so you, so you got, got your product, right? And then you bottle it, you box it or something else, and then you hand it over to someone who's transporting it. So typically what this particular individual gets is a like stack or maybe just one piece of paper that just will say, oh, he picked up 5,000 bottles of this particular wine. <laughs> And that's that, right? Yeah. So that's the that's the little piece of information that makes it from that first data silo mm -hmm. to the next data silo, which is then the warehouse, for for example. So and you you don't know nothing about the warehouse, right? Yeah. And specifically, you you have no way of tracking the relationship between the particular bottle that you then buy as a consumer to narrow down uh, whether or not mm -hmm. this bottle that now you uncorked and it turned, y you don't know who was the responsible party for this as an example. Yeah. And you can, needless to say, come up with many, many more examples where this has great utility. Uh, the, the one that always comes to mind first to me is um, there's almost no year that goes by when you don't have a recall from a particular brand of car, yeah. where, where, where a car, gets recalled because they uh, they had constantly yeah they had Electri uh, electrical um, yeah mechanical uh, yeah. structural there's always something that's going to happen yeah and what happens in in all of these scenarios is that they're going to call back all of these models so yeah. if you've got a ford explorer that was made between this and this time you get these letters in the mail right um then please bring it in we need to inspect it so yeah. and nine out of ten times uh, they won't replace anything um, b because they just check and say, oh, yeah, it didn't have the faulty part. It was only X, Y, Z. The reason for that is be because um, you could not track the individual parts. So if you were able to track this particular part from its inception, have it be born on the blockchain, so to speak, track it down all the way to when you swipe your credit card or otherwise wow. take possession of the title for that car and you could identify, well, this particular vehicle is also linked to these particular other items that were stored in a certain way, were shipped in a certain way, etc. Then you could actually pinpoint to the batch that had this particular wow. fault, right? Yeah. And you can easily see where this can save millions of dollars in otherwise uh, wasted yeah. time and expenditure because w before that you were unable to have this granular function of tracking. Yeah. And just phenomenal. Yeah, if you multiply wow. this just by the time that gets wasted by because oh, you're not yeah. able to do this, right? So millions of man hours. All yeah, over the so country, yeah. Yeah, if you recall 5,000 cars, right? So you mm -hmm. got 5,000 people that need to spend whatever time they need to spend to return yeah, the car, three, pick it two, up again. They're unhappy about that. The dealership has to pay for it. No one, and um, 
all yes. those techs that are sitting there working yeah, for nothing. This is yeah. just one of many, many yeah. examples. But yeah. um, well, then on, also on wine because I I had done a show with a guy that actually the, day, the same day I met you. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, a guy, uh, uh, Jacob um, Nair David, that had a wine utility token. That okay. He had a winery in, in Jerusalem, in fact. Okay. And he was blockchaining there, and he was talking more about the, the fact that you could um, uh, verify that this is actual real bottle as opposed to fake bottles. The, there was a, a whole, whole thing with uh, counterfeit wines. Uh, right, and so that does, that's kind of a small imp implementation of that, I presume. Um, back then, the standard didn't exist. but yeah. So it's all about, honestly, um, being able to track this on the public blockchain because a lot of these functions right now just exist on the sidechain, which is basically to say they exist in a database that a certain entity controls. Okay. So um, a, a lot of these particulars um, still need to be implemented, but that's why we're looking at the space. So we're looking at other applications in the space already. Long term, they're, they're then becoming super interesting also from uh, the actual widespread adoption of these. So you can imagine a scenario where you have a point of sale system that's attached to the blockchain that has all that information, right? So mm -hmm. you, you would just um, hold your phone next to the POS system and it will move all also, not only would you move the, the physical pieces into your cart, but um, Th this particular app would then move the virtual implementations of those items into your virtual apps, right? So it would add to your virtual wine cellar or it would tell you, uh, this is my, my virtual fridge, right? So I got, you could see that this is in my fridge. I bought this on this day. Uh, th this yeah. You could see it on your phone. So that, that gets rid of all these ideas of, of smart um, refrigerators, right? Because it's more useful to track when you bought it and know when it was produced and how it was yeah. treated rather than I have a picture of it in my fridge or not because <laughs> it's not going to provide you with that particular yeah. information with that particular history. Yep. And so there's an enormous amount and wealth of information possible once you start going down um, these particular token standards. And that's why we are super excited about A, this, uh, the 721 standard, then, then the evolution of that, 1155. Um, where you can create this granularity of information and then transfer this across the value and supply chain. And mm. so that's how we're looking kind of at the space. So what, what has immediate utility and will we'll save um, suppliers and uh, consumers real money and time? Right? Because a lot of times when people uh, talk about blockchain implementations right now, they just talk about cryptocurrencies and crypto kitties. Uh, it takes a little bit of explanation, I think, um, to, to see what the actual utilities of these are. There's very few people that t talk about that yeah. right now, and yeah. very few people, I think, understand it uh, right now um, that go into this type of detail and spend the time to analyze what, what's possible, what, what should be implemented, and what should be implemented today. Right? Yeah, and then once once they've come up with those ideas and they need a, a whole team of developers to create that app or that environment, right? Yeah, and so w we're trying to educate uh, this particular space uh, right now. So we're working with a bunch of game publishers and so we're now we're working with a bunch of wineries and tequila companies and whiskey companies. And, wow. and so, uh, and that's, mostly to, to further this particular standard, right? And then do, do the implementations on, on top of that because yeah. um, also from a v VC's perspective, mm -hmm. if, if you're on top of, of your game, you want your portfolio companies to have this particular advantage, right? Yeah. If, if you're in the supply chain game, if you're in the POS game, if, if you're uh, in the gaming environment, y you want your portfolio companies to have early access to that, right? So and know what you sh should start working on today if, mm. if you're doing a, an, a game today you sh you should you must implement the, uh, these particular standards right because it just creates another audience for you it creates more utility for you it creates more utility for the buyer it opens up other marketplaces it gives you yes. options yes, it does phenomenal man this is great
Well, it, it, it's cool to start seeing right. more uh, more of the actual implementation of, of uh, the usefulness of the blockchain instead of just hearing people talking about, oh, we need the blockchain. Uh, we're, we're yeah, what what do you need it for? And yeah. and yeah, and most of the time, specifically, if the incumbents use the word, it's just a slight upgrade um, from an actual database. Most of the time, you, you really, really don't need it. Mm -hmm. And it, it comes down to under understanding the principles of the blockchain because the principle of the blockchain is it allows you to create value transfer protocols that lead to peer-to-peer -peer systems. So what, what I mean by that is so th all, all the things that we outlined just now, um, they take out a lot of middlemen. They don't yes, take, take them just all out. they're increasing right? the cost of something for no reason. Right. Uh, they don't take them all out, obviously, but... The the initial um, exchange from production to like from from production and, and buyer um, right now you could do a peer to peer right mm -hmm. obviously after that uh, there are still uh, people involved that need to actually transport the item and so forth and maybe even build a marketplace but you don't have to you you mm -hmm. could just put your inventory online before it's even created and let the market find the price for you and you probably should. Right, at least with a subset of your inventory, you probably should, because right now the this whole price finding process for a lot of these items is left to uh, middlemen that obviously have their own agenda, right? So they they're gonna play one um, provider against another one because they also need to make a margin for for yeah. their efforts, which a good portion of that you should avoid, right? You, you should just sell it directly to your most important customers and clients. Specifically, if you have something that is limited in supply, like yeah. like a wine or something else, where your inventory by definition is only going to be 100,000 bottles or it's, it's um, an item you wanna create in a scarce way, where you want to create artificial scarcity or you want to create uh, something that's very special and you just want to test something, right? It's very hard to do this right now because in order to get it on the shelf of, uh, let's say, a supermarket, if you have a product that requires wide production, um, it, it, you would incur a lot of cost if you were to set aside part of your production and create that particular specialty wine that is, I don't know, aged longer or has this particular nuance because we added something to the soil or whatever scenario you could imagine. Mm -hmm. And uh, this paradigm allows you a lot of creativity because now you can, uh, I mean, s send an email to, to the actual end user and you can build this end user connection and tell them, hey, let us know what you think about this. We, we made a limited supply of 10,000 bottles. They have a slightly orangey flavor. And if that's something that you might be interested in, we'll, we'll put it up for pre-sale. And now, now you have an argument to go back to the supplier and say, yeah, this sells because we sold 10,000 bottles already wow. <laughs> in the yeah. expectation that people are going to like it, right? Yeah. And y you don't really get this option in a lot of cases, right? In a lot of scenarios where, hey, you, you have to make it first and get it into someone's hand. Wow. Well, well great, man. Um, I see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, these wineries, especially in Temecula, that could uh, really benefit from this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody should at least give it a try. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's very little to lose. It's a little bit of time and effort, but... Um, yeah, well we have a team here that can help with that, and we'll. Well, it's, you know, it's kind of like I, I, I understand that that when Porsche came out with uh, the 918, they they sold them before they made them. I didn't get one. You didn't get one. No. Okay. Yeah, they they actually sold. They they yeah. did a pre-sell of these. Yeah. But they did I a mean, test market, realizing that there was going to be a gigantic demand, so they had sold a bunch of Porsche before they had actually made them. So they actually had the money to build them right. before they uh, before they ship them. Yeah, I mean yeah. Te Tesla does this to some degree too. Yeah, right? yeah. They, you buy the car first and they build it. Well, yeah, and most well, you put yeah. some money down if you want a new Roadster. Do yeah. you put some money down yet? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go write on my check today. Okay.
You yeah. do that. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, um, great, man. Uh, it was good seeing you again. Good to see you. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's keep it going. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm preparing something right now on. Oh, when it, on, yeah. What's uh, you've got? You've got uh, articles coming up on Forbes. You've got. You've had articles before. Yeah. Right? This is more detail on the whole 721. And you, um, are, are you uh, are you just going to be a uh, a regular on? Uh, yeah, I'll try to give him something once a month. So average so that they, they, they published a few things that I wrote in the past and on topics that we talked about too about the DAO and about crypto investing and right now I'm, I'm, I'm writing on two topics one that we talked about in the past this whole security token topic which doesn't seem to be going away and then okay. I have some thoughts on, on the future of money basically yeah so all right I'm trying to we'll put talk, some we'll nuances on that we'll okay. see We'll do a talk on that one. Yes, we will. Cool. All right. Good seeing you.